Welcome back to Humans of Ethereum. In this episode, I have a very fun conversation with Alejandro Machado of the Open Money Initiative, or OMI. Alejandro and his co-founders at OMI are doing really critical work researching uh, and really understanding the lives of groups of people such as expats and refugees from his native Venezuela who don't have access to the modern financial system just to understand their needs and how they think about money. It's a very fun, broad ranging conversation. We touch upon topics such as human rights. We talk about uh, tribalism and other communities such as Zcash. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Alejandro. So without further ado, let's kick off with episode three of Humans of Ethereum with Alejandro Machado of the Open Money Initiative. Uh, hey, Alejandro, how are you? How's it going? Hi, Lane. Very good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for, for making time to chat. Um, super excited to uh, speak to you as part of Humans of Ethereum, because I think that you're one of the most important humans in our community and you're doing really oh, wow. super important um, work. <laughs> I'm humbled. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I am too. Really excited and honored to have a chance to speak to you about, um, yeah, about the human side of, of you and your work. Uh, so let's kind of dive in. So just start by telling us, um, you know, just kind of a bit of your background story, like whatever way of introducing yourself makes the most sense. Obviously, you're, you know, we're having this conversation because you have a particularly interesting and fascinating background. Um, mm. and, and kind of like what you were doing before, you know, joining you know, us here in the rabbit, in the crypto rabbit hole. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, let's get started. So uh, I am originally from Venezuela. Um, I was born and raised there. I planned to live my entire life there, but you know, uh, things happen. Uh, we have a horrible regime oppressing the people right now. And, uh, I found the need to go and, and work from outside. And, I, and I, my, everything that I do is kind of connected to the goal of restoring democracy and, and trying to, to move back to where I am, feel like I'm supposed to be. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a long process. And, and uh, I have found, you know, through my, my careers, like I, I studied computer science in undergrad, and then I did a master's in human computer interaction. So my professional skill set is uh, is a techie skill set like it, it, it's a tech stack right and I feel like the the way that I can help uh, the community of people that want to achieve like a change in Venezuela the most and, and obviously including me uh, is through just by being outside not not actually being inside I'm not you know like a demonstrator who is going to like rally the streets and, and uh, you know just, I, I, I did that and I, I, I yeah, you, you kind of need like a, like a specific way of being to do that. And I, uh, I think I am better suited uh, to do this kind of work from, from the outside. And it's, it's very difficult to work in Venezuela if, you're, if you have to use the internet or if you have to work with technology um, or if you have to avoid certain topics, you know, like if you, I wouldn't be able to say like my honest opinion on the state of affairs and the government if I was bound like to like if, if I had to be there physically. So in that regard, uh, I that's that's the path that brought me here. I have moved back and forth between Venezuela and other places. Uh, I did my master's abroad. I did my, my undergrad there, but I did a study abroad program. So I've studied in Europe and I've studied in the US as well. And uh, at the moment, I'm kind of hopping between continents. I like, spent some time in Panama, spent some time in Colombia, in the US and Europe, uh, where part of my family lives. And um, I think uh, the way I, that I kind of found my way through this is I, I was doing remote work for a company in Berlin that uh, you know I, I lived in Berlin briefly and uh, I, I continued working with them uh, and um, I since I I could do the work remotely I could explore Latin America a little bit more because I, I, I wanted to do that I wanted to see what life in Colombia was like and what life in Panama was like and so on in Argentina so I did that and uh, I, I also like to write and I still write about what's going on in Venezuela and Latin America and so I wasn't really into this like whole crypto situation like a lot right I, I wasn't very deep into it I, I had met with Palaji Srinivasan once uh, we had like a 
De Niro, like there were obviously like more more people, but I think he always struck me as someone who was like really bright and really like fu- like a futurist. And I, I always like respected his tweets and like the way of thinking about the future. And I read The Sovereign Individual. So I was kind of like already curious about it. And my, my friend Demi Brenner is a CEO of Zeppelin. He was like the one who really like got me like like made like the inception right of of like this like seed of of, of interest but i think it really took off when actually the government of venezuela tried to release the petro and i was just kind of critiquing the whole like debacle of it and uh, i started writing about it and i got some traction and i got you know more active on twitter because I, i was always on twitter but mostly reading and then i became a more active tweeter and um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's when it started. And then I, I decided, okay, look, this is maybe something that I want to look into more because it's still technology, it's still information technology and I have a background in this. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of product people in this space. So why not just do some, something here? And then in the beginning, I hadn't put the two goals together of like helping Venezuela and you know, developing a career in technology. And so on. I, I treated like them them kind of separately. I had like this Venezuela critique, crypto stuff, and then I started also critiquing like designs of DApps. Like, and I I, I made a, a medium post last year. I think it was around July or so, where I put together uh, kind of like a like a long uh, article about um, how different. DApps uh, would would measure up in terms of like what what kinds of guidelines would we issue would, would we as product designers issue to developers and how like in, in you we like I devised like a set of heuristics of like oh how user friendly or how usable this is, is this app or this app and um, I in the beginning that was like kind of kind of separate but then I found uh, that it made sense to, to start researching a little bit more about the, the situation in Venezuela because there's this narrative that cryptocurrency is able to change things in, in places where there's economic collapse. And I just like started listening to some more crypto podcasts. One of them, uh, What Bitcoin Did with Peter McCormack, uh, he brought Jill as a, as a guest. And then I listened to that one. I think Jill listened to mine as well and we decided well, let, let's connect like what what we are doing kind of seems similar like what we not we were not doing anything yet but we were curious about it and we were, we were thinking hey like what if Venezuela could be helped in some way or like we how, what if we could research how much cryptocurrency can actually help in Venezuela and then um, that was like around the time of Zcon Zero last year and then I, fl- I flew to Zcon and I met up with Jill I met Zuko and uh, there was a lot of interest in the, in the electric coin company back then, uh, the Zcash company, around the idea of, you know, just how, how do we make sure that this is worth it? Like, how do we make sure that cryptocurrency is actually useful to people that really need it? And so they, they gave us a small budget and they hired us as contractors to understand, you know, in a very, with very, very broad strokes, how how people were using cryptocurrency in Venezuela and if there's anything that could boost Zcash adoption, for example, in Venezuela. And so we, we did a project with like, this, this, this project that was like very, very much like second-handed research. You know, like we, we talked to people, but it was like kind of far away uh, and we collected some data and we, you know, speculated a bit and, and tried like very small, you know, tests of like, seeding cryptocurrency and using ambassadors and so on and, and setting up a wiki to teach people about crypto and so on it was you know a set of, of kind of tests um but we we kind of realized uh because i well i also went to san francisco to meet with jill where, where she's based and uh we uh I, ideo actually I, the ideo collab was uh very gracious and and they, they like opened their doors to us um and uh there we met Jamal Montessor, who's the third founder of, of the Open Money Initiative. And uh, there we realized we needed, like if we, if we wanted to do something that, that, would, that would be more informative for the crypto community as a whole and, and more real, you know, with, with, more, uh, with more, more certainty that, you know, like the, of, the, of primary sources, we would need to organize kind of a research trip to get as close to the problem as possible and to kind of, get like an ideal style approach, you know, like design research, trying to search what, uh, you know, what, what, what 
are people doing with money in Venezuela, not only relating to cryptocurrency, but in general? Like, how do people feel about money and what are the habits that are getting ingrained in people's, uh, you know, the everyday behaviors um, because of the situation that they're living? And so that's what we, we decided to do that. And after, you know, we kind of ended the, the Zcash uh, research project, we, we said to Zuko and we said to like other uh, friends we made along the way that we wanted to do this as a, like as a nonprofit and we wanted to do this as a research organization. And, and, to, and we started fundraising for this project of like trying, trying to like make uh, some, like, or, or do some research about how people are using money in Venezuela. And I think, um, yeah, that, that was like late last year, like the fall, fall of 2018. Um, along the way, you know, like I, I had like a series of kind of experiments and, and like de development experiences. I, I went to East Buenos Aires uh, and did like some work there for identity solutions, uh, blockchain identity stuff. I think it may have been where you and I met for the first time, if I remember. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's also, so, you, you mentioned Demi Brenner a little while ago. I, I mm -hmm. just spoke to Santiago Siri as part of this, uh, as part of the series as well. And oh, so right. he's the person who held my hand and walked me down the rabbit hole in 2017. So, oh, that's shout, so out to, shout out to all the amazing Argentines because yeah, they, shout they out get to this stuff, right? They get it. They, yeah, <laughs> totally. they, they know what's up. And yeah. it's, it's, part, it's part of our story as well. I think that's interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I did like a series of, like, so I went to East, East, uh, East Buenos Aires, I went to East India, I went to East Berlin. And in East Berlin, there was something else that was interesting was that I, I wanted to see how difficult it would be to create a wallet that ran on the phones that people have in Venezuela and were in Spanish and it would be easier from a UX perspective to like onboard and to like send money around without using addresses. So we like ended up using payment links and so on. And it was, it was actually quite possible to build a small prototype of, of a wallet uh, that, that would have these characteristics. And this is something that I think I want to like, continue pursuing because I, after all the research that we did about how people are using money in Venezuela, I think there is still, there is a place, it's not going to be like the silver bullet, of course, but there is a place for sending money around in a digital fashion for people who don't have PayPal accounts, who don't have Zelle accounts, or, you know, just they want to interoperate with one another. But the, the big challenge will be, of course, creating liquidity for whatever currency we end up using. So that's, that's one of the things. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, as you know, I've been following your work for quite some time and been a fan of it. I think that the, the design approach, the product approach is just so essential. And um, I, I think when you and I spoke about this uh, in Croatia a few days ago, I said something to the effect that like your work is what gives my work purpose, you know, as I work on kind of like the base layer. Um, that's great, but it's a means to an end. And I think that, that end is, 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 is meeting, you know, humans where they're at and, and, and building tools that help them solve problems and, and hopefully make their, their lives a little bit better. Um, so thank you for that important work that you guys are doing. Oh, thank you for providing the foundation. Without a foundation, nothing would exist in the game. And thank you, Satoshi, for that too. I exactly. Mean, we wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, I agree completely. So I want to go back to, to OMI and talk slightly more about it. In particular, your decision to build it as a nonprofit. Can you tell us uh, why you guys chose to go that route? So we wanted the research that we did uh, to be non... So neutral is a, it's kind of a funny word, right? But it, we want it to be protocol agnostic, okay? So we wanted uh, people from all communities in crypto to, to kind of pitch in. And because this knowledge benefits everyone in working in cryptocurrency. And uh, to show that you know, we were serious about not favoring any chain over the other, we decided, okay, we're just going to make this like as transparent as possible. We actually affiliated with the Human Rights Foundation, who is our fiscal sponsor. And we framed this, we're framing this as a human rights issue. We are framing this as a, as, a, as a right that people have. And I think it makes a lot of sense to be fully accountable and for them to be, you know, just... Uh, so what, so what is the right? The right is access to open money, something like that? Yes. Yeah. So, so that, that's the idea. Like we, we believe that people have a right to, to participate in the financial systems that they, they want. Right. And in Venezuela, that right has not been present since at least 2003, uh, when the government decided that they would mandate who gets access to dollars and who doesn't. So they, and this is like frequently called capital controls or, or forex controls. 
uh, in Venezuela, this has been a feature of of the government for for very very long time. So in in sometimes you talk to Venezuelans and they they not not lately because this is all broken down obviously. But, but you know in 2015 or 2014 you you would talk like people would get amazed like that you could like freely swap currency when you when you would travel abroad. Like oh what do you mean you can like swap euros for dollars? Like where is what where is the paperwork that I have to file? Where is the government agent that I have to talk to? And there's you know just. So we, we live in such a, such a weird world. And I, I think we, at the Open Money Initiative, we, we all believe that uh, this is uh, something that we should change. And I think we, we should strive uh, for a world where people can voluntarily participate in, in other financial systems. And, and if there are open financial systems, then, it, then all the better. So, but... Again, we, I think that the way that we are doing or approaching work right now is, is research, right? So we, we are trying to understand first how, how these like, situations come to be and, and what people do in, turn, in, in situations where uh, money is being heavily controlled. Uh, and yeah, society in general is, 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 is obligated to follow these rules regarding money. Cool, that's a, that's a really compelling vision and it's, it's hard to disagree that, you know, both that money is so central to who we are and to the way, you know, I, I think it's been said that money is a form of communication, right? So you could, you could almost frame this in terms of free speech, right? People should have mm -hmm. access to, to kind of express their preferences using, you know, yeah, like you kind of said, like whichever kind of um, currency makes the most sense for them in the most situ in, in, in the given situation suits their lifestyle. They should be able to kind of transact freely and openly and, and both that it's important as well as that, um, well, the reality in places like Venezuela and many others, right, is that, that, that people don't have those freedoms and, and um, the incredible impact that that can and hopefully will have on, on the lives of, I mean, many, many, many millions of people around the world. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, can't, can't overstate that. Um, so just give us a snapshot of what, what are you guys up to at OMI right now? What, um, what type of research are you guys doing? You know, are, are you gonna stay in research mode for a while? Are there any plans to develop a product? Like kind of what comes next for you guys? Yeah, so we, we fundraise specifically for the project, for the Venezuela project, and uh, that project we are in the late stages because we, we set out to go to the field. We, I, I spent a couple of months in Colombia. We as a team spent one month to really focus and then hitting the interviews and, and doing the diary studies. Um, and then we had the post-processing of like, you know, just gathering the insights and, and picking up the post-its and, and mashing them together and seeing what patterns we, we can, we're, we're able to unlock. If you watch the, the talk uh, at ZCon, I think it's, it's on YouTube, you can, maybe you can link it, that we go into way more detail uh, and, uh, and you can follow along like the, the insights that we have. And we're planning to create content, you know, like more in like the form of blog posts and like more shareable written information about, you know, what, what we found. So we are at that, at that stage where we are like compiling uh, the stuff that we have, like we already compiled the stuff that we have and then we are like sharing it onto the world and we we're hitting a couple of more conferences and so on. So we are still in like that, that kind of like sharing mode. Um, we have a couple of directions that we could go into. Um, my preferred direction is to start focusing on product. So kind of like, how Wikimedia and Wikipedia are this is like a nonprofit that controls or creates a product that is like a basic infrastructure, you could say, for for human knowledge. I would like to to be in that position as well, but this is something that is challenging because what what we, the money that we raised uh, first not that much, and second, it's uh, it's certainly not enough to like pay out pay like a team of engineers and create like a startup uh, out of this, right? So. Perhaps, um, and, and, and also we want to make this effort sustainable. So maybe the nonprofit route is going to be a dead end if we want to create, help create products that are targeting the, the people who need it the most. Maybe there, there needs to be kind of a business model for this and it needs to be uh, something that uh, is bringing money uh, back to the organization. So there are ways that um, we're, we're still thinking. We're still thinking what, what the best way forward is. Um, and uh, there's also a possibility of like setting up research projects in the future where I know we're not discussing this, but like perhaps in other countries and other geographies or other societies where, where money is also kind of a, uh, a problem or, or an interesting phenomenon, um, then I think the Open Money Initiative could, could go there and could do similar research to what we did 
uh, there. But yeah, at the moment, um, I think like so. I, like I said, I can only speak for for like like my own personal preference right now is to to make sure that products get get built and deployed. And particularly for me, I, I have a special stake in in Venezuela. So that's what I, I think would do regardless of, of the direction that the organization takes. Obviously, we want the organization to persist and to be a shelling point for the people who care about human rights, money as a human rights uh, issue, and, uh, and so on. Um, and then we want it to be global in scope, obviously. We, we want to learn the lessons of, as, as a community, as a global humanity, we want to learn the lessons of what happened in Venezuela and perhaps what happened in Zimbabwe back then, and perhaps what will happen in other places, what is happening right now in Argentina with high inflation, you know, all these lessons, we, we need to learn them, and we need to understand, you know, like, what, what is the right balance? Like, how, how much, how do you govern money in a way that you can still allow people to have their freedom to, to exit and enter systems, but also in, in a way that it doesn't, it, like, it works for, for for everyone, it works for for the poorest, and it works for the for the people who produce uh, more things, or the people who who have to be incentivized to stay at the top, or you know, just just to align all interests, uh, the interests of the powerful, the interests of of, uh, of the weak, and and how we do we progress collectively as as humans. Absolutely, yeah, um, that, that that resonates quite strongly. I think um, I, I hope you guys. Are able to achieve the vision that you're describing of of developing an incredible product, which I'm sure you're, you you could do. But uh, even if that doesn't happen for whatever reason, I think the work that you're doing around collecting, collating this knowledge, um, the doing the research, and and you know, uh, archiving that in a format uh, for um, you know for humanity, I guess for 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 the other humans, for all of us, I think is is incredibly incredibly important, valuable work that that should really be supported. Um, and and again, it's just just so sorely needed in in the space. Um, Thanks. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely share uh, links here where people can, can watch the talk you mentioned, the Zcon talk, and, and you know, mm -hmm. just kind of check out what you guys are doing and read some of the research as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you kind of partially answered this question already, um, but I did want to talk about funding a tiny bit more. So I know that you, you mentioned that you guys had um, a grant from, that was from ECC, right, from the Electric Coin Company? Or was yeah, it from so the foundation? It was. So yeah, uh, we we started out as a, as a project that was like kind of incubated by by ECC, right? Got it. Like when, when Jill and I were, were working together, and then we we added kind of Jamal to the team, kind of like late stage. Yep. Um, and then so that that was just to like pay our salaries, and we yep. did like a little bit, like we had a little bit of budget to work with other uh, companies to try to like get the wiki to be popular and other like small things, right? It was just like a small budget. Then, so the, the question is just, just what have, what have you been doing, which is what you're answering, what's been working and what's not been working around funding? Yeah. So what has worked, what, what has worked, uh, has been to reach out directly to people that we had strong connections with. And, and Jill, I, I wanna I give a special shout out to her because without her, none of this would be possible. She already had been spending quite a few, maybe two, three, three years in the industry. And she is a person of extremely good integrity. And she's a person with really amazing work ethics. Uh, and as a result, we were able to connect with organizations like the Tezos Foundation and the Interchain Foundation and all well, electric coin companies also like and Zuko himself and uh, Zigash Foundation. So like she already kind of like had this aura of like someone who works hard and who knows how to uh, just manage money well and, and to execute projects and so on. And, and, and we, we had a, we had a good idea. We had a good idea to, to, to uh, provide some light into the ecosystem uh, in a space where there, there wasn't any in, in the past. So I think, you know, reaching out directly and having these personal connections was what made the difference for us. And then obviously we went through the grants application programs for, for each of these organizations they had. They were a little bit less formalized than they are now, which is, which is a good thing because now more people can access, you know, the, the, the formal methods of, of, of getting into. And so they, the underdogs and the people who are less well known in the space can also like find a way to, to communicate. And if, if they have a good idea, they should be listened to. So we, we still did like the whole formal processes and so on. And then we, we managed to, to raise enough money, thankfully, to, to execute this project. Um, 
in uh, on another uh, kind of like similar topic or you know or you know the same topic but like a like a sub project the the wallet that I mentioned that um, I we, we started at ETH uh, Berlin it's a project that I did myself like I, I I was hacking together with some friends that I made at ETH Berlin so Mikhail and some other friends of mine we like we were five people we were we were hacking and uh, we like had this idea for the wallet it's not it's like related to open money initiative because it like kind of crystallizes or, or like maybe is, is a potential execution of one of the, of the products, product visions that we, that we have like later came up with. Um, but it is still kind of separate. Um, as a result of our work in, in East uh, Berlin, we, we got in touch with MakerDAO. We got in touch with like much later uh, with Binance Labs and both uh, organizations decided to support the project as well. These are, much smaller grants. We're talking about uh, and MakerDAO uh, was able to offer us 20,000 uh, DAI and uh, Binance Labs is offering 5,000 uh, every month and, and there's like a roadmap and so on for, for the project. So these are amounts that allowed us to continue the work in the wallet uh, for as long as, as Mikhail, who is the lead developer, um, was able to, to focus entirely on it. But then, you know, since, you know, the, the very good people want stability and they want, you know, to have some sort of reassurance that there's enough money in the bank to support his, the, the, the project for, I don't know, like six months, a year or so on. It, if you only have 20K, it's, yeah, I mean, you, you can make it work for some time and you can like have it as a, as a side project, but it is something that uh, you can't like attract top talent with. So we, we struggled a little bit with that. Uh, uh, thankfully, we were able to produce. Did, did, is it still sounding okay? Okay. So thankfully, we were still like able to produce uh, an alpha version of the wallet that is now on the Google Play Store uh, in, the, in the alpha beta uh, distribution channel, and uh, it's I, I would say about ninety percent finished. We still need to polish uh, certain things, and we need to make sure that it works on on certain devices. But it is already like out the gate, uh, able to work on, on the old devices that we specifically target, targeted for, which is like what was part of the big deal. We were also using the link drop protocol, which Mikhail kind of partially invented. And, you know, it was, it was kind of like a unique situation where I was able to work with like a, ver a very good React Native developer who was also passionate about this stuff. So it was like kind of a perfect storm. Um, but yes, not, now we are kind of struggling with that as well. Like, like how, how do we make sure to like to push this over the finish line and to also attract people to keep working on this because uh this is a project that this wallet project for example is something that will require like if you have only a closed ecosystem where people are sending die to each other that would be great and like that, it, this wouldn't require a lot of maintenance like maybe some code maintenance certainly some code maintenance but and, and like obviously some like security audits and so on but it's not something that is like a massive undertaking but since you're talking about money and you need to be able to move money around like outside the DAI or XI ecosystem, you need to be able to have on-ramps and off-ramps. This is a much, much larger scale project and you need more funding for, for it, like more proper funding for it. So this is one of the things that, you know, we are, I'm, I'm considering, should we like have this project, you know, like start raising money for this project uh, and then who should we talk to? So, um, I think it's going to be slightly different from, from our approach at OMI of like, oh, now we know these organizations and we, we want to have like a, uh, we want to provide like information. This is a project that is already a product and it might fall under the purview of OMI, you know, like it's it, it kind of uh, an articulation of a, of, a, of a product that OMI wants to see in the world, uh, but it's not really, it's not the whole crypto community should should join together into this project. It, it, it should probably be a project that is more kind of self-sustained or, or has can, should have kind of a, a business model or revenue model at least. So that's uh, what I'm thinking right now. And, and I don't know if in the end, these two projects will be, you know, you know like OMI will formally support or, or like will be kind of the, uh, the OMI flagship product. Maybe, maybe it, does, maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense. Uh, because you know one thing is nonprofit and it's like protocol agnostic and so on. And this is like 
this like incarnation of this wallet is kind of a kind of opinionated, but it I I think in particular it it got it's got a pretty good shot at at being adopted if we can solve the liquidity issue, which is obviously a, a, a big if. But yeah, we'll 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 see. This is something that um, a lot of people and teams are struggling with right now, um, and and it's 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 early days, right? I'm I'm hopeful that um, that for the teams that are doing you know, the hard work that you guys are doing and that are building in particular, you know, usable products that have like a clear use case and a clear, um, uh, well, let's say a clear mar product market fit, if not a clear business model, right? That, that the business model thing will, will kind of sort itself out. I mean, it, maybe we, we need to be more aggressive than that. And, and um, you know, there's been some work done in, for example, the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians. There's a business models ring. Um, I don't know if you guys have been involved in that, but but kind of trying to put our heads together and come up with, you know, like new ways or, or, or borrowing, you know, ideas from kind of Silicon Valley yeah. that, that might work. I, I do. Helpful. I do think we should be more confident. Like I, I think yeah. I, I've, I've realized over, you know, this is like I've, I've never done a startup before. I've worked at startups almost all my career, but I've never actually had to lead one. And I think the key or one of the keys is to just be confident and then just like show that you have a product that people want. And um, yeah, I think that the money can sort itself out if, you, if you're able to persist and you're able to talk to the right people and you, you talk to enough people and eventually you'll find people who are interested and who will fund you. Um, yeah, but this is very different. Like if you structure this as a, as a deal that you, know, you get into and, and investors are actually investors and not donors, it's a very different way of, of like, you know, because you're, you're not, no longer doing this for you know, let's let's do good by the people of Venezuela, or let's do let's make sure that that uh, the money that the early uh, Ethereum adopters uh, is well spent, or or like you know compensates uh, for you know the, the the all the scammers in the space. You know, it's not no longer that pitch, but it's a pitch of okay, let's make some money together, and that's that's I think a powerful pitch. Yeah, if yeah, we can I mean, find a way to, and, and I'm sure we will, but yeah. uh, at the moment, yeah. Yeah, I don't think any of us are anti-capitalist. You know, it's I find this no. endlessly fascinating. You know, there, there's clear socialist influences and and kind of ideology at play here. I think in our community, but at the same time, as I said, like I, like I I'm a firm believer in capitalism, and I, I know that you and many of the rest of us are as well. So how do we? I don't know what the right word for it is. Is it humanistic capitalism? Is it is it you know capitalism that 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 recognizes that there's more in the world uh, and, and more kind of stakeholders than, than just, you know, uh, in, in maximizing financial gain for, 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 for shareholders, that kind of thing. We have to figure that out together. I think. Right. Um, yeah. I, I want to just, just a tiny, tiny bit more about, uh, talk more about the wallet just because it's so interesting, right? And I, I, you've demoed this both, I mean, I, I, I've seen you demo it and you've also demoed it publicly before. Um, but it's really cool, right? The, the design requirement, if I remember correctly here, is that um, it's super lightweight. As you said, it runs on, you know, <laughs> I, I'm a mobile developer. I was doing mobile apps before Ethereum um, and I was um, doing them in healthcare and I was not in Colombia or Venezuela or those places, but I did spend a lot of time in uh, kind of the deep south of the United States. And, and what I think they have in common is that people are running very old phones with no free space and very old versions of Android, that kind of thing. So the software has to work on all these old devices. Um, yeah. and, and if I remember correctly, you're able to generate links and share them via WhatsApp to send money around. Um, it's really, really mm -hmm. cool. I mean, again, we'll share, we'll share a link here so people can kind of see a demo, but um, is there anything else you wanna share about uh, how that works? Yeah, so basically, I mean, it's just very simple requirements. Is this like a, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is like uh, kind of like a Venmo without banks. It's just like the simplest way to describe it is you have this wallet that, you know, if you don't know anything about cryptocurrency, you don't, you don't really need to because everything, you know, you see dollars in the screen and uh, you send dollars around. And the way you send dollars is by generating a link. The link acts like a check. And then the other person can cash in the check. And the way it's designed, and if you see the demo, it'll be clear. It just like abstracts all the whole details away. Even transaction uh, fees are abstracted away because we're using Meta Transactions protocol. And um, you know, if, if we're using like right now, we are using the XDAI, like a proof of authority chain, which allows us to subsidize a lot of transactions. So it's about six thousand transactions for one dollar. And at the you know the the expected scale that we are initially rolling this out, it, it's going to, like the, the the money that is in reserve uh, for the project is going to allow the, the funding of many, many transactions, right? Um, 
And then it remains to be seen, like, do we, do we gradually introduce transaction fees so that people can transact? Or is the proof of authority chain really the best uh, option? Maybe, you know, there are other options. There's the Binance chain. There are others uh, that uh, could be interesting to, to explore, right? But the, the most important thing is that we, we need to deploy, when, when we do deploy, it has to be a system that, that works and, is, and it, it needs to be rock solid. It, it, you can't, if, if you have a production error, if you have a production bug, uh, it's going to deter, like it's going to tear down the confidence of, of like a lot of people for a very long time. Just like one of the things we observed when we were talking to people in Venezuela was that they, they heard about the Petro, they heard, heard about the state cryptocurrency that, that Maduro wanted to release and they associated with Bitcoin because they heard, they heard the terms cryptocurrency, Petro, Bitcoin all together and they made like a mesh, you know, like they, they said, oh, okay, fine, like this. this is all a scam or this, is all, this all doesn't work. So many people who heard Bitcoin, it's like, oh yeah, I don't want anything to do with that because that's, um, that's like the Petro. And, you know, if they, they, if, if they really like looked into it or, or if they like had never heard about it, maybe Bitcoin would have helped them uh, achieve some financial goals that they had because we also chatted with people who had another idea of Bitcoin from before the days of the Petro that you know, had, had made it work for them quite successfully. So this is something that we, we need to be really, really careful with when, when we do release. Uh, but it is something that, that I think holds a lot of promise. Totally. Yeah, I agree. And I think that um, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think a lot of other projects and teams will learn a great deal from the research and the work, the design work that you guys are doing. So very valuable. Um, changing gears a tiny bit, I, I want to ask you a bit of a high level question here. Um, what does Ethereum mean or represent to you? And, and feel free to interpret Ethereum broadly. You know, I, I think this absolutely includes, um, in some sense, kind of Zcash and um, even just kind of cryptocurrency or blockchain in general. But what does it represent and what does it mean to you? So let, let's let's start by by talking about like um, like my my fellow founders at Omi. They I think they're more maximalist, like Bitcoin maximalist than I, than I am. I would say that I I mean I respect Bitcoin's uh, conservatism, and I also respect you know like communities like Zcash who are more you know a little bit more moderate, more more cent centrist, if you will. Um, but I do have a soft spot for Ethereum because. For me, it represents innovation. For me, it represents the desire for progress and innovation. And I know that it doesn't often deliver on that promise, uh, but that's okay with me because I don't see, I see Ethereum as, a, as an experimentation board. I, I don't see like, and I know it's like some, some people may take issue with that because there's real money being like deployed in Ethereum, but there's also responsible teams that are making sure that they make good by their users so like for example dharma is a, an example of an amazing team that is building stuff on ethereum MakerDAO, right there are teams that are it, it's all about the teams that are building on it it's not i don't think when when people like you know complain about ethereum this ethereum that it, it it varies a lot because people have like issued different promises on ethereum and i think that the core system you know i think works pretty well i think, I think has has stood the the, the test of time uh, in terms of you know how how open it is to experiment on for financial applications and for some you know other applications of blockchain that are still very speculative um i think i mean there, there is um there's grounds to to be critical of or, or skeptical of, of certain features of the ethereum ecosystem but i i find myself right at home with the optimism and with the cheerfulness that and also the the, the inclusivity you know like the people are are very or they try to be inclusive they try to be tolerant of others opinions and so on and i, I really i really appreciate it I, I i don't think there are a lot of communities like that i i would i would also say that the zcash community is like that and i i like that a lot, a lot. uh and there's a lot that people say about bitcoin being bitcoin maximize being toxic and so on i don't i don't think that's the case for for the people that i talk to that i that are or considered themselves bitcoin maximalists but yeah, there's, there's a lot. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, I, I think that answers your question like that. I, I, li I like that about Ethereum. I like the, the optimism. You, you know, you, you may say that sometimes it, it's a bit irrational. It's like an irrational optimism, but I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with a little rationality in my life. I, I like a little bit of chaos too. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I agree strongly with the point about like in chaos and embracing it. I, I, I call it kind of skeptical optimism or optical, uh, optimistic skepticism. I guess it's some combination of those things. Um, right. No, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, kind of the maximalism, tribalism thing. I mean, this is a topic that keeps coming up again and again, both in these conversations as well as just in broader kind of crypto Twitter world. Um, I personally find it frustrating and, and a bit ironic as well, because from my perspective, um, so, so I, you know, joined the, the broader kind of blockchain community in 2017. And uh, I, I think, you know, what was kind of going on in the Bitcoin community at that time. Uh, I was very turned off by what I saw in Bitcoin and, and very turned on by what I saw in Ethereum, which um, strongly, right. what, what you said strongly resonates with me, definitely the optimism, the more of a welcoming feeling, uh, you know, more innovation, experimentation, that kind of thing. And so I'm, you know, my, my personal perspective here is it's very frustrating to see that we've begun to lose some of that in Ethereum. Uh, and maybe we haven't, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that's just crypto Twitter. I think that's a perfectly valid uh, way of interpreting the situation, but to see an increase in kind of, you know, kind of like tribalism and stuff. I'm just wondering if you have any advice on how we can uh, work through this. Yeah. I mean, I think we definitely need more, more like collaboration across the spectrum, you know, like, uh, like, like uh, efforts like Cosmos are, are very, very welcome. And I think how, finding like, or going to conferences that are not uh, the conferences of your preferred or, or your, or the, or the thing that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think you're, you're a very good example of that. You go to conferences like Zcon, you go to conferences like, I mean, in interesting conversations, you could be there and, and, you know, it's, it's uh it's healthy and, and even like bitcoin conferences if you if you if you want to go and and share your point of view i think you would be welcome as well so uh i think we need more of that we need more of like cross like curiosity of, of other chains and i know it's a lot because once you're comfortable in in a chain uh you kind of develop and especially if you're very technical, you develop a very like thorough understanding of how the, your particular stack works and so on. I think it's easier for me to say that as I'm, as I'm a slightly higher level person that, you know, it's, it's kind of like looking at things at, at a more, uh, in a more abstract way. Um, I see a lot of things that can be, that you can put like ostensibly uh, take from one place and, and put in the other or experiment with. And um, yeah, and I think this ties into the point that we do need more product people in this space. We, need, we do need more thinkers that think about applications uh, and money applications in particular, because as much as I like, like the experimentation on other, on other topics, I think what is proven that like, blockchains are useful for is for moving money around. And um, I think we, we are lacking more, you know, more ways to do that or more, more creative ways to do that. Uh, in all chains, right? So, um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, in particular, so I agree, obviously, you know this with the, the, the sentiment that we need more product people. That's one of my, like, lonely personal missions here. I, I guess I'm not alone. Obviously, you feel that way as well. Um, but, but especially with what you said about kind of cross-chain or cross-community collaboration, um, you know, it's very true, right? It's, it is, I say it's a full-time job just to keep up with the pace of change in Ethereum alone, which it really is, you know, the technology, the community, the new things that are emerging, even like keep, even keeping up with layer one is a full-time job, much less the stuff happening at layer yeah. two. Um, so it feels an impossible task to keep up with, with all the, the other projects. Um, however, right. I, I've, I've um, had the, the great fortune to be able to, to attend events like ZCon's a great example, right? I was, we were both at ZCon one a few days ago. Um, that was great. It was really, really incredible. You know, it's such an, a, a welcoming community and it's so refreshing. You know, one of the big differences between Zcon and Ethereum is that uh, I've noticed that the folks in Zcon tend to be a little bit older and a little bit more experienced and have a little bit more kind of real world experience under their belts, uh, which is right. Because I think there's a lot of lessons that, that the Ethereum community can learn from Zcon and I'm sure vice versa as well, right? Yeah. So we strive for, for more of that. Um, yeah. And I would go even further uh, and encourage people in the crypto community to attend events like the Oslo Freedom Forum, right? Because like it, it, it is a tangential topic, but, you know, if we care about this technology impacting people's lives and we care about money or moving money around as a human right, I know this like ties directly into OMI, but I think that the link is, is quite clear and, and HRA in particular has been an advocate for Bitcoin and, and for developing uh, blockchains 
you know, in the, in the past, you know, like I think it, they, they've underwent kind of a transformation where, or, or they, HRF has always been very technology aware and technology oriented and they, they understand the role that technology plays in our society and how fast it changes. So they're always the first to spot the, the opportunities like in among the human rights organizations. So perhaps we'll see more of them uh, embrace this kind of like ideas in the future. And like, you know, there's some experimentation in the World Bank and other like international institutions, but I, I would I would encourage people to to kind of like look a little bit outside their their comfort zone of like only crypto conferences and crypto communities, but also, you know, communities of human rights defenders, communities of even, you know, talking to central bankers, I think is essential, you know, even like if you want to understand how we're going to reinvent this or how we can contribute to the reinvention of, of money, I think is, you know, understanding how people have done it. I don't think enough people really do understand. Uh, and I, I myself I don't understand how, how money works. I, I, I don't claim to understand it. Uh, but we're all in this together. And, and we, if we like, we are privileged to be in a world where we can share information with almost anyone almost instantly and we can talk to other people and you know it's if we are kind to each other and if we are you know we, we try to make smart arguments and, and put energy into our discussions and, and good faith i think we can even get nuriel rubini to to like have a reasonable position on, on something right. that we that we believe in, right? To change his mind, yeah. Uh, so I, I could not agree more on what you said about the importance of our understanding the way that existing financial systems and money work. Um, I, I just recently learned um, from Sunny, Cosmos Sunny, about a, a course on Coursera, I think, that, that does a really good job of explaining this. I'll try to include a link to this as well, to, to this course. It's, it's open and it's free. Um, and he said it's like completely changed the way that he uh, thinks about cryptocurrency and about blockchains. Um, Oslo Freedom Forum, great suggestion. You spoke at the one in New York last year, I think, right? And if I remember correctly, that's available as a podcast or a video, so we can link to that as well. Um, and I want to mm -hmm. include a shout out here to uh, Radical Exchange. Um, this is an event that uh, happened a few months ago in Detroit, and there'll be another one, um, I guess, next year as well. Uh, so it's it's not uh, it's not a blockchain project primarily. I mean, there were, there were a lot of people from um, multiple com you know blockchain communities who were there, but. Um, it was one of the most eye-opening events, you know, where we were able to rub shoulders with uh, economists and philosophers and ethicists and kind of people from many, many different walks of life and fields. And, you know, uh, another thing I feel quite strongly is that um, there's a bit of a naivete, at least in the Ethereum community and probably in Bitcoin and other communities as well, where we want to kind of dispense with all the legacy crap that we dislike about, you know, the world and, and build better things, uh, better alternatives. Uh, and yet, I think we have a tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And I think that there's a lot that can be gained from engaging with um, practitioners and uh, you know people like politicians and um, and academics as well. So yeah, uh, echo absolutely. those sentiments. Yeah, I, I think we should be more afraid of the blank slateism that some people have, because if you remember, you know, like let's think back to 1917 when communism was such a great idea, right? Uh, I'm not saying that we are on that track, but we, we can certainly appreciate how, you know, an idea can, can seem very beneficial and very good in under a certain historical circumstance because things are just going so badly for some people, right? And I'm, I'm sure that the people who tried communism at first thought they were really, really going to liberate humanity and they were going to bring peace and prosperity and, you know, they probably really, really believed that. And like, you know, after a century of just pure, uh, the, a, a demonstration of like how the human spirit cannot be crushed and, and cannot uh, withstand that kind of like loss of freedom that, that accompanies the, the total centralization and control. I think that, uh, that an ethos of total decentralization and total freedom uh, without barriers is maybe also swinging like the pendulum way too far in the other direction. Totally. And I think we should, rather than be completely, uh, you know, just like radical about like our, what, what we believe in, I think we should be strong to call out human rights abuses of, of places where we think uh, they're occurring and when where there's, uh, you know, there, there are certainly countries that, that clash very heavily with, with what we're trying to do. And we should, you know, 
have uh, informed arguments and, and you know, we, we should uh, denounce things in public and so on. But I think we should also stay humble uh, in regard, with regards to the things that we believe in, right? To, to the, or or the, the things that we choose to radically implement, right? Uh, I think we should kind of approach things with caution in some ways. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't mean I'll always follow to the letter what, you know, people, you know, like the most conservative people in society are always saying, because that's not how society progresses. Society progresses by occasionally ignoring certain rules that are there, because if you, if you didn't have the chance to break rules, uh, society would, would stagnate. Uh, completely like the you know and there are many examples of this that are have been I think positive in the last century or so you know like uh, uh, equality in marriage uh, you know there's there's been so many so many changes uh, in, in in society that you know have uh, you know the, the the legal legalization of certain drugs as well and that's you know we don't yet know if it was like if it was that that was swinging the pen, pendulum too far on the other end but I think that we as a species should still experiment and should still shake things up because that's the way we we keep learning this is we we are we are here to learn how to live and um and not to just blindly follow rules completely agree i couldn't have put it better myself i mean that's that's a really powerful argument um that's a fantastic clip on its own i like that so much thanks for sharing those thoughts of course um, yeah moderation is important um you know i, I like to say no isms <laughs> um yeah, and, and have values that, that you believe in. And, and I think that, uh, and Alex Gladstein from Human Rights Foundation says this, uh, and I think I, I'm taking this from him, uh, Bitcoin, and you could, you could even extend this argument to blockchain technologies uh, when they're decentralized, uh, is kind of a, it, it is an embodiment, a technological embodiment of liberal principles. It is the idea that no single entity should be in control of something as important as money. And I think this is a very powerful force for groups and powerful actors to want us to go the other way and want to centralize power completely. Totally. Um, you know, it's interesting, you, you mentioned, um, and I agree with this, that there's a tendency in society and human societies over time to kind of centralize power and to agglomerate rules as well. Right. And so it, it's incumbent upon us yeah. to break those rules sometimes. Um, and to introduce, I had this great chat with Santi about this topic. We called them hand grenades. You know, we kind of want to like toss a few grenades here and there and kind of break a few rules and introduce a certain degree of creative destruction, but do so in a, in a kind of controlled fashion, uh, if we want society to progress. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so we're coming right. up to an hour. I, I, I want to move into a quick rapid fire round. So I've got three final questions I want to ask. Um, sure. So the first one is, what advice do you have for newcomers, for people who may be kind of joining our community or our ecosystem? I think just be kind and, and seek out people who are kind because um, there are people who are smart and, uh, and that you can be impressed with their arguments and with their way of thinking. And you can read their stuff, but if you're going to engage with people like that, the way that I learn is primarily, you know, I, I start on Twitter. Like I, I don't learn just on Twitter, but I, that's where I start to source my content, right? I, that's where I find interesting leads and then I follow up on readings. And I, I think that when you, kind of have the expectation of, of the person that you're engaging with on, on Twitter or you know, other, other forms of online communities that the other person is kind and you are kind yourself, I think we are, we're creating a good culture. Uh, and it is, it's kind of difficult to, to maintain a, a kind culture because we're all spread out and we have so many, like we, we live in different places, we have different cultures ourselves and so on, but we, if we can create that expectation, I think that, that, is, that, would, be, that would be the best thing we could do. I'm just uh, one rule, if there's only one rule and, or one recommendation is to, to be kind and to seek people. I love it. That's, that's great. We, we, we somehow need to turn this into a meme or a hashtag <laughs> or something. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe humans of Ethereum or, or, or humans of the network or humans of blockchain or something could, could be part of that meme, but uh, that's really amazing advice. Uh, cool. Uh, thank you. The next question is um, who else should I, or should we uh, speak to as part of this 
uh, this series. Um, who, what other people or teams or projects are doing fantastic work that may be uh, a little bit less well known or a little bit less appreciated or funded? Well, I am a big fan of Dharma. If you haven't spoken to, to anyone at Dharma yet, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, and I think uh, a little bit outside of the Ethereum world is the, the people who are, you know, uh, activists for liberalism, you know, like the, or, or modernity, right? And, and the Human Rights Foundation is a, is a big part of it. So maybe you can talk to Alex Flatstein. I know that he is, uh, you know, he has appreciated the benefits of Bitcoin uh, because it is, you know, to face the facts, the most liquid uh, asset that you can buy from anywhere. It is the most likely to survive a state-sponsored attack. So I understand why he is the fan, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think that he would be open to talking about, and he's, I, I, don't, I don't know if he considers himself a human of Ethereum, but Maybe, um, maybe he is, well, you know, he's certainly a human that cares about the ethos uh, that Ethereum people share. So that, that would be a, cool. I think a, an interesting conversation for sure. Oh, I agree. I mean, I, I would love to expand beyond Ethereum, the network. Uh, I guess I'm using the term Ethereum or maybe Ethereum is a better term in, in a very broad way, a very broad sense here. Uh, and yeah, maybe we need some more inclusive terminology, um, but, mm -hmm. but thanks for the suggestion. Uh, and I really hope that, that this project um, is not centered around me. I really hope that folks like you and everyone else are able to kind of go forth and, and you know, uh, continue the conversation and grow this into oh, something I'm sure, exciting. I'm sure there will be, yeah. Cool. All right, final question. This is an important one. Um, handing you the mic, right? So what is the one message or idea that you would like to share with the Ethereum community? Uh, wow, well, so I'm, I'm just going to play my, my the line that I, that I always say, if I only have one, to, to say, I always say that, um, you know, there's this expectation that uh, blockchains will help the developing world. And there's always this, this distinction between developing world and developed world. I would call on blurring that distinction or like just forgetting that that distinction even exists. You know, like I, that's not the way to slice the cake. I think the way to slice it is which societies need access to open money the most? Which societies are the most economically oppressed and why and and what are the things that they are they are doing to overcome that you you if you focus on that natural you know human creativity and human invention uh how can you leverage that and turn that into products because if you are able to do that you already have a winning application i think you know gaming and nfts and you know they're they're interesting and like identity and so on Sure, like it, let's by all means continue the, the explorations there, but I, I would try to like call us back a little bit out into money and, and, and why, you know, and, and, and who really needs this uh, in, in, you know, the, the most crucial and the most uh, meaningful uh, way, you know? Cool, thank you for sharing that message. That's, that's really powerful. Um, thank you for, for sharing so much time today, chatting, you know, telling us about your story and what you're up to. Uh, and, and again, on behalf of, um, you know, on behalf of everyone in the community, like really thank you for the work you guys are doing. I think it's, it's, it's fantastic work. And, um, as I said, I, I you know, I will continue to, to do my best to try to find ways to support you guys. And I hope that others hearing this, um, uh, can, 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 uh, join that conversation and be a part of that as well. Um, and we'll share, we'll share links and things here for people who want to, you know, reach out and, and donate or, or offer time or whatever the, the best way. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Reach out to me. I'm A L E G W on Twitter, uh, and my, our uh, Open Money Initiative handle is Make Open Money. So, where does the G W come from? I have to ask. I've always been confused. Uh, with it. So I I ran a script that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that tried to get a five letter uh, handle, and I that's where I got it. I love it. But now I mean it's so it's it's a little bit it's my name with a little bit of randomness. It's, you know I am my name i am me with a little bit of randomness we all have randomness yeah. in our personality and our and our identity so i thought it was fitting i like that i wonder what mine would be maybe we can try running it again <laughs> <laughs> thank you again so much it's been really a, Thanks, a great pleasure chatting with you about all these amazing things yeah likewise muchas gracias and uh... <laughs> thanks for listening if you'd like to support the open money initiative or any of alejandro's work there's information here in the show notes on how to do that. 
Tune in again in a few days for an interview with Nina Bresnik and Alex Praetorius of the Ethereum Remix and Play projects. Nina and Alex are a really cool couple and they've got a really awesome backstory. Um, they've worked with migrants in Berlin. They have founded startups before and they're now building a really important piece of infrastructure in the Ethereum ecosystem. So be sure to check out that fun conversation in a few days. As always, this show is completely volunteer produced and self-funded. So if you'd like to contribute funds or time to the show, check out information here in the show notes on how to do that. Have a great week and see you back here in a few days for the next episode of Humans of Ethereum. Mm -hmm.